Welcome to the final episode of Series 14, everyone. We've got an excellent conversation for all of you with most of the folks from Neoscum. But before that, we have the normal announcements. First up, we wanted to say thank you to everyone who was able to donate to the GoFundMe campaign for Jeff from System Mastery. It's going to help out a tremendous amount. Jeff is out of the hospital now and on the way to recovery, which is fantastic news. We are <laughs> super happy for him. We like yeah. Jeff alive. Jeff, you hear that? We prefer you alive. Yes, please stay alive, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> now we prefer uh, all our friends, really. It's true. Most of the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> you hear that, Jude? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next up, uh, next week marks the one year anniversary that we released episode zero into the world. Uh, since that is the case, right, we've actually recorded a Q&A episode that we're really excited for you all to hear, uh, which means that we are not accepting any more questions that we've been asking for for the last few episodes because uh, we already answered everybody. So, Well, we will in about two minutes. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Stop trying to predict the future. Hey. Finally, if you'd like to support us, there are a few great ways of doing so. You can always check out the One Shot Network Patreon at patreon.com slash one shot podcast, which helps not only our show, but other shows on the network. You can also get access to bonus content of many of the shows on the network for hours of endless entertainment, except not endless because it's just hours, uh, but it's a lot of hours. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, potentially endless as we are continuing to add things. So just put it on a loop. Yeah, there you go. It's endless depending on how you do it. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to or are unable to support us financially, you can also leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podchaser, or our Facebook page. Every review will help us out by pushing us up the rankings, which will get more listeners, which in turn will grow our community, which in turn makes us feel super great. And that's really what we this is about. <laughs> uh, reviews like this one from I Refuse from Canada on iTunes. It is titled Great Podcast. I joined in at the System Mastery crossover, and I quickly enjoyed the thought that went into how the show is structured. They don't just make characters, but they also discuss why the choices were made and how those characters fit into the mechanics that make the game unique. Lots of deep thought and introspection about the stories this game is built to tell, how each guest's character creation philosophy blends into that story. Also, lighthearted and fun. Love it. Well, thank you. I love your review, I refuse. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, with all of that out of the way, let's get on with the show. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time we created a group of characters for Shadowrun. This episode we will be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Eleni, Blair, and Mike of the Neoscum podcast. We do not have Casey with us this evening. He was unable to join us, uh, but we have uh, three amazing people as well. So. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves again for everyone at home and tell us a little bit about the characters that you made in the last episode? Sure, I'll start. So I am a Lenny. Um, I'm all alone this episode. My comrade Casey is MIA. So I'm really going to do my best to represent Teacup Piggy. That's T-E-E -E, Cup. <laughs> And Piggy is spelled P-I-G-I. -I. Just very, very important details here. <laughs> um, who is a pixie, a uh, little tiny little piglet who has just, you know, is a little bit of a, it's kind of like Piglet from Winnie the Pooh. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I'll just kind of, everybody's kind of like, ew, who is this piglet? But the piggy knows a lot about mm, art and dancing and songs and smells. <laughs> Is that all I'm supposed to say? That that sounds about right. All right, cool. Cool. Awesome. Uh, 
I'm I'm Mike McDowell. Um, with Blair Britt, we have created Saint, who is a uh, is a human Christian theur- thurgist mystic adept, uh, which is basically the uh, shadow run uh, class that we had to make to recreate Jesus Christ, uh, who, who was born in a vat. Yeah, um, I forgot that that's what you did. Yeah. <laughs> How could you forget? Yeah. And uh, well, it's, oh man, because it's been a couple that's weeks. True. Normally that's we true. do all of this together, and it's been a couple weeks, and I forgot about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> forgot about Jesus. I gotta say, this is probably one of my favorite characters I've ever made. But just real quick, some of the hits: uh, Jesus or Saint, as it's as he's called. Uh, he spells his name S A I N T. All of those are, uh, you know, it's uh, it's an acronym. So. And we don't know what it stands for, I don't think. We're going to find out through sessions of yeah, play. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, he is also accompanied by the Holy Spirit, which is a, like, spirit companion. And while Jesus himself is a pacifist, the Holy Spirit has a assault rifle ready to mow down the enemies of yeah. our Lord. And also the, the Holy Spirit has a little cocoa taxi, uh, which <laughs> yes. presumably it's driving around teacup and saint. Uh, oh yeah, teacup is just probably sitting on uh, Saint's shoulder, very small, but also smelly. And Saint does not want teacup on their but shoulder. But you, you know what? Saint is really adept at animal handling because you know they're a shepherd, um, <laughs> and teacup is a little pig. Yeah, so that's that's true. They get along. They get along. Uh, there's a, just a ton of negative qualities and positive <laughs> qualities that we could really get into. Also, Saint is a boxer. Yeah, he knows uh, how to haymaker. Even though they're a pacifist, you know, you have to like... You gotta have one move in your pocket. Yeah, just in case. In case all else fails, <laughs> and his you can punch the, somebody real hard. His is the pacifist haymaker. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we could, we could get into all that, but I assume we'll get into that through Convo. Yeah. That's amazing. Ryan, do you want to talk about the character that we made? Yeah, we made an elf decker by the name of, I believe it was Aura? I think so. Yeah. And um, spoiler alert to everybody in the room in Chicago, um, Aura got her name from her mother, who used to be a hacker back in the day. So it was an inherited I name. Know this as a player. Oh. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, she is basically just a really, really, really good hacker and uh, also enjoys uh, some uh, frivolous arts and other uh, things that really don't matter for hacking. Spill the beans. What are are the frivolous arts? I don't remember. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't say this last time, but my character on Neo Scum is an elf adept, not a hacker. And she goes by Pox, but her real name is Oracle. Ooh. So it's kind of like Aura. Also, yeah. your character enjoys so frivolous they're, they're arts cousins. as well. Yeah, like, frivolous arts, absolutely. Like pop, pop music, right? That's pop one of music, your skills. Mm-hmm. Fences, which is actually just the art of, of fence, not, fence making not anything to do with stolen arms or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. All right. Well, let's go ahead then and dive into our segment that we are calling D20 for your thoughts. Okay. In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on character, on the character creation process and how it feels in this system compared to others. But first, we'd like to ask how each of you got into role playing games in the first place. Oh, um, I will start again. So. Role playing games in the first place. I got into because uh, I'm in the improv community and a lot of people play role playing games. And I think uh, my coach for one of my teams was like invited all of us over to play uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And I had never played it before. And he was just really good at explaining it and getting us into it. And um, the the fact that you could do anything. I made a, a tiefling that um continued to try to persuade people to like pee on themselves <laughs> and, do, and do all kinds of stuff that was not helpful at all and my group kept saying please attack and don't do this and i was like nah i'm gonna just keep doing this other stuff <laughs> um it was very fun very very fun and yeah that was my first i guess true experience with uh role-playing games that sounds like you picked up the the general conceit of it right away then, which is not doing anything that the game says that you're supposed to mm-hmm. do, but just doing like whatever the heck you want. 
I'm pretty sure that's how these games work, right? Yeah, we, totally. Because I had like played a lot of board games and stuff. And the fact that this was like so open ended, I was like, amazing. I don't have to be anything. I can be horrible. Here we go. Yay. Yeah. Hey, you have given me too much power and that was your mistake. Uh-huh. Not mine. <laughs> I was horrible with love, but you know, I I was trying to make the bad guys pee on themselves. Uh so I got my start. Um I and Mike, I'm cutting in line because No, go ahead. Uh because Mike is actually the one who probably got me into role playing games. So congrats, my man. Wow. Uh, cool. I, I'd always been like kind of, uh, you know, like tangentially interested. I played a lot of like magic when I was in uh, middle school and high school. And so like Wizards of the Coast was always something that I was like pretty up on. I feel mm-hmm. like I just never really had a group that played D&D or any other role playing game. But then uh, Mike and I were on a comedy team uh, at IO Theater. Giving them a plug on this episode. And You're welcome, episode. Sharna. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah mike would put together like a bunch of like role-playing games uh with sort of different groups and i remember one time i went over and played D &D, um and then another time him and ganon our game master on neoscom were essentially trying to like get together a shadow run group and um yeah i just like i came and played like probably like three times over the course of like three or four months and then eventually we kind of like nailed it down to a few people we wanted to work with and uh that's kind of how i got my start i definitely have I, it is weird because I have way more experience playing Shadowrun. I mean, I guess at this point, this is all of us, but so much more experience playing Shadowrun, this horrendously complicated tabletop <laughs> RPG than any other tabletop game ever for me. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I would agree probably. Yeah, I I got my start playing role playing games like when I was a kid, just like playing with my action figures. I just would play them by myself. And well, I'm, then Barbie yeah. was role-playing games for me. I, I never a lot, considered, but like, Barbie is a role-playing game, but, like... Yeah, okay, cool. So I did a lot. I feel like that is just role-playing with no actual game attached mm-hmm. to it, though. Yeah, the game was which Barbie stands last. They would kill each other. <laughs> I, I remember I used to make my... I, I had some Mage Knights, which were cast-offs from my rich neighbors who collected like little miniature hero clicks type things and they didn't like care for these like trash ones so they gave them to me and i would make them fight my legos in these epic battles uh but anyway i was always trying to play like D D, um but i didn't like know the people who play D D, and or i would like try to hang out with them but they were kind of like gatekeepers <laughs> and i couldn't play and i feel like i've always had a like a chip on my shoulder about like wanting in to play games and i remember in college no one else uh like played any role-playing games so i was like i'm gonna try to learn the rules but like i have adhd and it's like really hard for me to organize these these things and like i remember scheduling was like always why things fell through or we would get one game together and it wouldn't go well because like i wouldn't know the rules and in the moment like people would just be getting like drunk and high and then like by the end of it uh, it was just like, what are we doing? It's like, this is just like a wild college party now and we're not playing, we're not making a cool narrative. But finally in Chicago, I met like other improvisers and we got our start like playing Fiasco, Ooh. which is like a cool game, which you don't really have to plan for. And mm-hmm. uh, then later that turned into like with Ganon and uh, other people who I, I knew from the improv scene, we turned it into like Shadowrun and we turned it into our podcast, which we have now. And I'm like so grateful to have finally found, you know, the people that I play role playing games with. But for a long time, I was on the outside looking in like a little like a little street urchin <laughs> on Christmas <laughs> Eve, looking at the happy families uh, outside, just getting cold, you know, just wanted to be let in. The tiny Tim of RPGs or? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> So when you guys are building characters for these games, what is your personal process? Do you have a a way that you like to go about building a character in any system? Um, You know, some people like to go from like picking a a character from TV that they want to rebuild in a system or they have like a certain idea of what they want to play. How do you guys go about doing that? Um, My process for most uh, role playing games is usually like I kind of like. I try to pick like one thing that I want the character to be really good at and then really like dive hard into that and try to like maximize whatever like starting characteristics you can take to emphasize that one like particular thing. 
um, like for example, in Neo Scum, Zenith is a hacker uh, or a decker, and I just like dove into that, gave him a ton of stats like along those lines. Um, and then usually there's some sort of framework within the game that like you're grabbing sort of like tangential skills that are related to other things. So I sort of like branch out over time into like related stuff. But I also think what's interesting about Shadowrun is that you can like I- I've had to make a few in Shadowrun now just for like some of the other stuff we like do for our Patreon episodes and the Neo Scum Gaiden. Um, and a lot of those I end up just like looking through like the positive and negative qualities, like picking one I think is funny or cool and then just sort of building a character around the the like role playing concept of what either that like negative quality or that positive quality. Yeah, I think I'm a little bit the same in that I will look through like the available skills of whatever thing it is that I'm playing and try to get inspired by that. But I also have like a very pretty extensive theater background. And so I think the idea of like clowning comes into it for me for characters. And on a very basic level, like a clown has one or two very driving uh, emotions or driving Mm -hmm. Um, hungers so and it could literally be hunger which is one of pox's my character in neo scum mm. hunger and and candy and like the desire to eat um or the desire for love or the desire for whatever i'll try to like focus in on one of those strong driving emotion like desires and i let that sort of inform um the character that i build uh i i really i think that's really cool um i feel like sometimes I even just start with a name and then I just say the name to myself enough that like then eventually a voice is formed and then I'll like figure out a character from that voice and just go from there. Um, But also I like pull a lot from like pop culture and I'm like always reading and like watching and I'll like take tropes that I'm, I'm like currently interacting with and I'll just mix them together from different things. And then you're like, okay, I was reading this like 1850s uh, British war uh, fiction, and I was also reading this thing about like penguins. So now I have like <laughs> a penguin who's like a British colonel, and uh, he then you you then you have to give him like a negative trait so that it's funny. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah, and he uh, yeah he he just uh, he smells so bad. And then those three things, you're like, okay, you have a character. Just give him a name. That's awesome. Your name is Stinko. (laughs) (laughs) Stinko. That's amazing. So specifically about Shadowrun, how do we think character creation in this game stacks up against other systems that we've played? I think it's ludicrously complicated. Yes. (laughs) It's insanely complicated. um, But I also think that it is uh, really inspirational just because there's so much, you can sort of get lost in the sauce with it and be like, what the heck am I doing anymore? Mm-hmm. I don't know. But if you do try to, if you just pick up on one or two things and sort of go with it, you can find some really, really cool inspiration for your characters and for your story and all of that just by looking at like the the stats that they give yeah. as uh, options. Yeah, I feel like I, I like the Shadowrun character creation mainly because now I'm familiar with it, so it like really is a lot easier to mm-hmm. do. But I feel like for anybody picking up the book, you would get like excited to start building your character. You like put together the initial framework, and then all of a sudden you like have an initial idea. You've maybe even picked out like a few traits or characteristics that you like about this character. But now you have this like accounting job of trying to like make sure that every single one of your skill points is like allocated correctly. And I think like the the issue uh, that Shadowrun like struggles with a little bit is like giving you enough motivation to like complete the entire process because I can't tell you how many times I've built like half a character mm-hmm. on and then stop and and then just stop yeah because it's like oh well I figured out like all of this character's abilities I figured out their attributes I gave them a bunch of positive and negative qualities I built their like cyberware you know like implants uh set up i bought all these like weapons and armor but i still have to you know like figure out their contacts i still have to give them knowledge skills like there's always just like so much yeah. homework to do i think the prolixity of like just deal like dealing with everything that you can customize in shadow run is like a learning curve that i think turns a lot of people away but it almost reminds me of i don't know if if you've ever like tried to play dwarf fortress uh which is like a like a ascii uh 
computer game that is so complicated mm-hmm. looking, has a horrible like learning curve. But once you get rolling and like once you've spent like 70 hours trying to play this <laughs> game, you're like, the most amazing story happened to me in this game. And then you're like weeping tears as you're like dwarves die. And it's like if you learn the language, like you can probably do whatever you want and make a really cool character. But there's probably other games to play if you're just trying to get up and, you know, Mm -hmm. play a game. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like Shadowrun's a game where if you have somebody um, like who knows the system really well, it's a breeze because they can kind of like handhold all of the newer players like through the process of creating characters. But like if you like I can't imagine like. I mean, I guess, like, uh, my head always goes to, like, a lot of people pick up tabletop RPGs when they're in, like, high school, and it's, like, I can't imagine a group of teenagers with no experience on Shadowrun just, like, picking up uh, the guidebook and, like, figuring out how to mm-hmm. play in any realistic way. Oh, yeah. I mean, but I think as teenagers, you have way more time to do that kind of crap, whereas, like, I think about it, and I'm, like, you know how many gaming groups as an adult I have that, like, never make it past the first session? And so Shadowrun is the worst game for that because you would have spent more time making characters than actually playing the mm-hmm. game whereas like in high school i think you are much more inclined to stick with it because you have nothing else going on in your life i mean yeah. maybe that's just me but <laughs> no no that's like fair. I, I think you have time to invest in in that that you don't as a grown-up with two children and a job and <laughs> absolutely know. yeah i i could see that for sure and i would say that like no, you put it perfectly. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was surprised that this was more complicated than Heroes Unlimited character creation. Uh, the Palladium books uh, character creation is notoriously... Uh, there's a lot of options, let's put it that way. But it's relatively straightforward for the most part. Um, so here it's more of a, well, what do you want to do? Well, if you want to be a hacker, it kind of looks like this, and now figure it out. Yeah, right. like they don't have like a whole like kit that they sell you on it. Yeah, you know? like it's like at least in D anD D, you're gonna pick a cleric, and then like it's gonna give you a bunch of yeah. stuff that are like ju- you don't have to like figure out what your level one spells yep. are, or well, you know, like you're picking from like a pool of stuff. I know in the main book they have some like suggestions for starter. Yeah, right, like archetypes. some starter. Yeah, archetypes, and they'll give you like. Yeah, you can just play as this character. This is their things mm-hmm. and go ahead. And like, honestly, you're better off doing that initially and then like leveling up that pre-made character mm-hmm. and then building your own from the beginning, I would say. Because when I first built my first character without using any software or anything to help, it was like I I couldn't get past the first page for so long and I kept... Then finally being like, cool, I can move on to the next step. And then it would ask me another question that then I had to go back to the first page. And I was like, what is going (laughs) on? Like I just, it it kept changing all the numbers and like it got so, so confusing that, um, yeah, I, we recorded a couple of episodes and then I was like, there's no way that I did this right. Like I'm so weak. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on. I, there's no way. And it turns out I messed it all up and I, did a horrible job creating my character mm-hmm. initially. Um, so, yeah, it's hard. It also seems like this game relies heavily on lore knowledge. If you don't know, like, what the world's kind of all about, you're not going to really understand it too well through the process of character creation. It's it's basically like D&D. You go and create that cleric. You know you're a cleric, and it has a little blurb right in there saying what a cleric is and what their role is in the world. So you kind of have a little bit of understanding of how you can play that character without knowing much about the rest of the world. Whereas here, it's so open-ended. If you don't go with those archetypes, you will have no idea, like, what type of characters you can even create in this world unless you dive into the lore a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think the character creation process teaches you anything about the mm-hmm. game, really. Like, I, I remember when we did D&D, we talked about how you kind of start with this, like, higher level idea, and it sort of funnels you down as you as you go. And this is just, like, it's so wide open that, like, at no point does it feel like the process is, like, getting mm-hmm. smaller or easier at all. It's just, I don't know. It's like being thrown into the deep end of a pool. It just, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. And because there are so many expansions and everything like that, like, 
it never ceases to be a lot. Mm-hmm. But yeah. uh, once you embrace that, I think there is a there is like a beauty to the fact that you're like, yeah, I'm in the ocean. I can swim wherever I want to go. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Um, yeah. yeah, it definitely feels like one of those where you get used to it and you're able to to really pull together some really unique and cool combinations, which is really nice. In one of our uh, our like guide in episodes, I made a character that delves into like more magic stuff. And I'm in the main campaign. I just play like a gun guy. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm really good at shooting things and knowing how those rules work. But uh, the character that I made, I initially like gave him all these magical powers. And then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and take some of these magical powers away. Because the rule book is stressing me out and <laughs> I like don't want to have to learn how to summon uh, like a giant pigeon goddess that's not in the rule book. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I'd much rather just like do a it, it, it forced me to be less ambitious just because I was like, I don't have time to figure out the rules for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Like it took Casey probably like I mean, he's still learning the rules. That's yeah. honestly why I originally made Pox just an adept with no magical abilities and no technological abilities because I was like, well, I don't know what I'm doing, but I guess we're recording. And so I'm going to know that I don't know any of this stuff. And I'm already confused enough that we're going to stick with being physically skilled and like, I don't need magic and I don't need computers. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In Shadowrun, they have this, there's this whole system where it's like you have the real world and then you have the matrix, which is like the digital plane. And then you have the astral plane, which is like the magic side Mm -hmm. of things. And it's like, yeah, I mean, like on Neoscum, we every once in a while will like dip our toe into the matrix, but in no way to the extent that the rules like allow Mm -hmm. for like a full on like matrix thing to where like every individual action you're taking is like a series of roles over and over again. And it's like the same. And we've never done that for magic. Like. The idea is that you're you're able to like move across the astral plane in the same way that you might through the matrix and like access other people or other cool. things and like yeah the the rule book is just it's yeah it's funny because I even in like the Shadowrun video games at least the the first one I've only played the first one but the way that they handle matrix stuff I always thought was just so corny where it's like now you're playing the same video game but it's just in like the most basic Tron. Uh-huh environment and in my mind if we were to do this in a role-playing game i'm like the matrix is a place of endless possibility it's like oh you you don't get to go to the setting you want in normal shadow run okay in the matrix you can go anywhere that's like you you could go in an internet that's more futuristic than the internet that we have mm-hmm. now uh and i feel like that's kind of daunting and then there's like so there's matrix and then there's just augmented reality on, on top of the astral plane as well yeah i remember one time Blair, you were like, does anyone else use augmented reality? And we were like, no. <laughs> we just don't want to deal with that right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like, uh, in order to keep, like, a cohesive, like, narrative, it definitely, you, like, Shadowrun, like, kind of limits your options in terms of, like, you're kind of drinking from the fire hose a little bit. And uh, the extent to which uh, an entire group of people are all going to be down to, like, drink from the fire hose in the same way is, like, I think that's really hard to find with uh, a group of people, like, role-playing. Mm-hmm. Go find that online on Roll20. Or something. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a thing that you you have to decide before you even start making characters is what kind of game are you going to play? What is this going to look like? Because I think otherwise you're going to end up with some wildly different things because there are so many options. I mean, one of the nice things about having that many options is that there's never a moment where you go, I can't make this thing that I want. You can, I don't think you ever get to a point where you have a character concept that you can't make into something like that. We have a teacup pig and Jesus. Mm -hmm. So clearly you can do pretty much anything (laughs) here. But I I think that sometimes not having those constraints can be really, really difficult to to work out because I get really overwhelmed when I have too many choices. And so Shadowrun is a game that like I sat down and I was like, I don't nope, I'm just gonna close the book and I'm gonna walk away and somebody else can figure this out for (laughs) me because it's like it's too much. It's it's too much all at once. I am down to all learn how the matrix works and do like an all decker podcast sometime or a campaign oh that'd be super fun where we're all just like keyboard cowboys just that sounds like a good name for a podcast and 
Keyboard, keyboard Cowboys. Cowboys. So you heard yes. it here first. It's ours. <laughs> yeah. That'll just be our next guidance series. Oh, perfect. Singers. Yeah. I love it. So how do you feel like the mechanics of creating a character reinforces how it feels to play this game? Or oh, does it? It does in a way because playing the game playing the game is just as complicated as creating the character. Mm -hmm. You know, every turn in, in Shadowrun, every single turn, every move that you make is a series of roles and calculations and stuff like that. So, you know, um, it's it kind of becomes one of those games where it's like, if you love doing that and you love rolling for every single thing, you roll for every single thing. Sometimes you gotta just say, I shoot over there. Okay, yes. Instead of saying, I shoot over there. Okay, load your gun. Okay, cock your gun. Aim your gun. <laughs> shoot your gun. And you roll for every single one of wow. those things. Some people like to do that. That's, you know, great. I'd say certain ones of those roles we will bypass. But, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's it's intense, the mechanics of playing. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like, um, Something that D&D &D does really well is, like, when you are creating your character, the mechanics are, like, super evident. Like, you're picking a skill that literally is the name of whatever the thing is that you would try to do with it. Um, mm -hmm. Or at least, like, it all seems, like, pretty related. But the thing about Shadowrun that's really uh, more complicated, I think, than it needs to be is that a lot of times specific actions actually have a different pattern of rolling for it. Mm. So it's, like, you know, if you want to, like, uh, like run or if you want to like jump up a building or something like that's a different it's not just like rolling your skill plus your attribute it's like roll your skill plus your attribute and the number of hits you get is the number of meters you make it up the wall and like Shadowrun is like full of those types of things where it's like it's not just like it's not the binary of D D where it's like did you get over the threshold because if you did it succeeds and if you got under it then it fails and if you crit fail it's really bad and if you uh you know, like crit on the dice roll, it's really good. And like, that's such an easy system. Whereas Shadowrun is oftentimes like, like a hundred thousand slices down any sort of potential outcome. And it's oftentimes like, yeah, I mean, you're like rolling to see the effects of like how many, uh, how many like minutes the drug you just took lasts. And, and I think like in that way, it kind of clouds what the mechanics of the game are from the creation perspective because you're taking skills that are like, gymnastics but you don't actually know what the literal role would be mm -hmm. to like do whatever thing you're thinking about doing with that skill i think maybe that appeals to just people who want the most customization as they can get like my my dad used to say that when he was in like grad school he his friends would like go play civilization the board game and mm -hmm. he would always be like yeah they would they would set up for about 12 hours and then they would play for about 12 hours what? and like <laughs> It, it would just smell so bad in that room and they'd just be like they'd all be just like thrilled like they were all on drugs just like yes the numbers they would go <laughs> yeah. for everything it sounded exactly like shadow run to some extent but with like slightly more numbers and math it's like if you like if you like math then well that's also i think in a way making the gameplay a little bit more like gambling than storytelling Mm -hmm. So you're you're adding in the dice roll and saying, I'm going to try to do this thing. And you're throwing in a gambling factor into it, which is exciting in, in a way. Like I could see that being something that's like, yeah, do I get to do it? I don't know. But if you're if really what drives you is the actual story and trying to tell a story, then sometimes some of the gambling has to be like removed a little bit um, or yeah. I mean, maybe sometimes the gambling just informs the story. And then you're just like, oh, both. I think, yeah, both. But I think. I, I see what you're yeah. saying. It, it's like the idea that like it, the more gambling you have in there or like the more chaos or random number generator, whatever you want to call it, the more of that that is in the game system, the less certain you can ever be of any decision you make, you know, because you're like, oh, I'm going to like jump up this building. Mm -hmm. And if uh, and if the game is going to throw a ton of barriers at you for that to even happen, then it just means that like that's just not going to happen in your story mm -hmm. as often. And I think that's kind of like yeah. the challenge is like, how much do you let that creep into your game to like make it feel realistic and like make those moments where you do succeed feel exciting? But then like where can you back off and like maybe let the narrative aspect of it just kind of shine through right. in a more real in, in a less realistic but more like, you know, uh, like role playing sense? Well, and when you change the difference between, you know, from success or failure, 
where it's like a 50-50, you know, it's going to be this or it's going to be this. And then you change it to, is it five meters, six meters, 10 meters, whatever. You're expanding the number of options too. And so it makes it harder to feel connected to that story, I think, because it's harder to mentally make the jump to, okay, what's going to happen next? It's harder to figure out where things are going to go when you have like 12 different options versus a yes or a no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It almost is like, at, at what point do you just say, you know what, let's just play a video game together mm-hmm. that is going to like do all of these calculations quickly so we can like move past that. Uh-huh. 100%. Like, like there's an episode of Neo Scam where we're like all trying to jump across this like building top and we're like, I think it's probably, and you know, it got edited for the final episode, but I'm sure there is literally just straight up 20 minutes of us talking about distances and like how far people can jump. <laughs> and that video game thing made me think like, yeah, in a video game, it's not like it's like, okay, this is going to be 30 meters. How long do you think, like, you know, all of that calculation is just done behind the scenes by a physics engine. Mm -hmm. And we had a guest that episode who had never played Chapman before, so, like, (laughs) much respect to Rashawn, who was there. and had got a very realistic experience, I would say. We were sitting there trying to debate. And then the other thing, too, is that, like, you know, you have those stats, like you were talking about, like gymnastics or whatever, and then you can have all those other things that you buy on top of it while running and stuff. Traits, like, there's a trait where you could... You could be really bad at gymnastics, but have one trait where you're like, for some reason, when, when you were a kid, you really liked watching the Olympics. So you have a theoretical knowledge of of like wall running. So it introduces like a new mechanic where you like flip a coin. Or, or so like, actually, you have a plus something on that because magically, but you have to remember that you have that trait when you're doing <laughs> it and that you're like, OK, there's there's one trait that I have uh, my character, Dak Rambo, who's like a wheel man. It's like my made up class uh, and I've never used it in Neo Scum, but I can like push my vehicles past their limits, but I have to like roll a D6 and that's like how many minutes I can do it. And then after that, I have to keep rolling to determine how much stress damage my vehicle is taking and never used it. Uh, Miranda, it sounds so complicated, sounds but scary. did I spend most of my karma on this ability when I was making my character? Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Do I have this useless thing, which is like, I might end up using it in the next recording. Who knows? Yeah, but, uh, who knows? Every time I go into a recording, I'm like, I have to be like, I have this ability. I should remember to use it at least once for the sake of like the fact that I spent most of my starting resources on it. Yeah. It could be really cool. Yeah. Right. So I, I want to ask, like, is, I mean, did you have to build Xanadu like an entirely separate character? So Xanadu uh, is a, I think, a GMC bulldog. We just use a template for, like, what their big, big van Like, whatever was. the biggest vehicle you could find was. And I think maybe we made some modifications just to make it, like, bigger and less wieldy. <laughs> okay. But you Because, do... like, I know that it has, like, separate stress and everything like that, too. So I didn't know if that was... Yeah. yeah. It, it has that seems, like... like, way more to keep track of than I would be <laughs> any ta- in prepared any, for. Like, uh, in our guide and things, my character, OK, has a helicopter. And, like, you guys have motorcycles and stuff. All of those have their separate we traits. Dodge Xenons. <laughs> dodge Xenons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they've all got separate traits. And then, like, you've got your pigeons that all have separate traits. Yeah. And so... Even Z's ocular drone is... It has its own, like, set of stats so that because why not yeah why right not? it's important like, that your eyeball have its own separate stats. when right? he's like piloting it outside of his own head like there has to be stats to like determine how well he can handle it you know like where he can take it how he controls it all this other you shit. almost lost it one time oh yeah 100 <laughs> percent. like i said i'm i keep my character real simple i'm like i give me no vehicles give me no uh, technology i got a sword and i got a whip get out of here i saw <laughs> i like when i was making z i was like I saw Ocular Drone and I was like, no way I'm not making a character with that. Yeah. Like, I was like, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I'm sure, like, of course, as soon as I started playing Shadowrun and I like, looked around, I was like, oh, yeah, like, this is this is the classic, like, boy. Every, every bad boy. Every poop boy. Every bad boy playing Shadowrun <laughs> uh, has, like, Ocular Drone as, like, their main skill, I feel like. Or one of them, anyway. Uh, I Ganon lets us get away with a lot for the sake of, you know, moving the show along. And to and for the sake of looking super cool, I would mm-hmm. say. Yeah, that's the the thing is, I think these rules are in place to make sh- to keep people honest. So it's like, oh, you want to make your character do something cool? Jump through all of these hoops. Oh, you did. Oh, you spent an edge. Great, they did the cool thing. I think we all have an understanding as improvisers 
who do like comedy that we we know we have to lose sometimes. So we will put like complications in front of ourselves and Gannon does not have to like go out of his way to keep us from getting too close to the sun because like every there's like been multiple episodes where we've shot ourselves in the foot intentionally because we were just playing our characters truth. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel like three improv classes or or three like different levels of improv classes will equate to its own role playing game system. (laughs) (laughs) So do you find that frustrating then that this game has all of those rules in place that you guys don't necessarily need because you you make things bad for yourselves because I know like I like games that have complications and I, I like when bad things happen to my characters and things like that. But I've certainly played with people who don't, who are very averse to any kind of negative consequences. And so it's important that games have that built in there. But like, I, I mean, if you're the kind of person that already puts those roadblocks up for yourself, do you find it frustrating that the game also does that? I I actually really like it. Uh, one thing I really like about the overcomplication is that it's impossible for you to know everything. So sometimes you like take an action and then you like look up the stat behind it or whatever. And then you're like, oh, my God, why did I do that? <laughs> I, OK, so I guess my character just didn't know what was going on and did this very stupid thing. And now we all have to live with the reality of it. Yeah, we took uh, red mescaline in one of the uh, our guide in episodes like several characters took red mescaline, without, which is uh, like a heavy psychedelic mm. in the Shadowrun universe. With we didn't really look up all the stats. I was looking at a website that had like I guess video game stats from red mescaline, which are different <laughs> than the actual Shadowrun stats. And we looked at it, and it was like, uh, okay, well, for the next eight hours, we are losing our mind, <laughs> and then for the next eight hours after that, our stats are basically like one for willpower and charisma. So. We're just going to be oh, high as heck. Just going to be laying on the floor <laughs> drooling for a yeah. while. Yeah, exactly. But that was so fun. Like that moment of like not getting it and then just reading the thing like hours after we'd already said that we took the took the drugs. It was like, <laughs> oh, my God, we are <laughs> we are so screwed. Like this is not going to work out for us. Like, I, I would also say that uh, going back to the idea of like uh, having having all of those rules, um, liking it or not liking it for me. I like that it's there for exactly the reasons that Blair said. Um, and I also like the fact that um, you can decide that you're like, I get these rules and we're going to ignore these rules. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. certain rules where you're like, I get, yeah, I get it. I get why I, we would do that. But also um, we're not going to do that because we're also, playing I don't our wanna. own game. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. don't want to, we're playing our own game. We're going to make this game work for us and be fun for mm-hmm. us and play it the way that we think is fun. And that doesn't always mean following exactly what is written on the page. Yeah, yeah, it's there if you need it. Yeah. Right? Like we're not going to roll for a recoil. We're not going to roll to like unsheath our weapons in combat. Like there's just like, are you some... kidding me? I've been rolling for that this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but if you know, but if Ganon was to say, okay, I want you to roll for this. I mean, Fine. We like, would we'll make ro- a we'd make a cheeky joke about it. Yeah, but we'd, we'd be like, "Why are we suddenly rolling for that?" <laughs> oh, rude. But then we'd be like, "All right, whatever, I guess." Um, I think that's one of the beauties of role playing games, though, because unlike video games where you have to play within the rules that they give you, or it won't let you do anything, you can just decide that there are some rules that you like and some that don't, or some that work for the story that you're telling and some that just aren't important. And I think that that's it, it leaves a lot of room to play the game the way that you want to play it. And, you know, for you guys, when you're doing a podcast, you don't want to do as many of those because you're cutting out a lot of those mechanics and stuff when you edit anyway. Uh So they're not as important. But I think for some people, that simulationist aspect is a lot of what they want to do. They want the math and the crunchiness of it. And so I love that there's the opportunity to play both ways for people. If you really feel like having all of those rules or if you're like me and that's just too much to memorize and you can't count to four sometimes, Mm -hmm. you can also just not do Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I said it better. I, yeah, I uh, I really like that, and I think Shadowrun's one of those great games where it's like it gives you such a complicated like network of like skills and all these other like mechanics and stuff, and you really can just be like, okay, well, we're gonna take some of this stuff. The only thing I will say is I would love it if they themselves would admit to themselves that their system is ludicrously complicated mm-hmm. and like <laughs> offer even just like, hey, so here's like a here's like, you know, A, B, and C. A is like super stripped down. The mechanics are really basic. Like this is mainly for people who are really hardcore role players. Then you have B for people who are a little crunchier. And then you have C for the people who are like 
crazy, crazy crunchy and want to like calculate the like decaying arc <laughs> of their bullet as they shoot across the rooftop. <laughs> I don't know much about uh, Shadowrun Anarchy, but from what I've heard, it sounds like it's a little more role playing friendly. I know that people have kind of like suggested it to yeah. us, but we like having a GM. There, there is a uh, more pared down Run. version of the Shadowrun role playing game that I saw out there. We'll never play. Right. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know much about it either. I know that people have very strong opinions about it. Yeah. Um, I have not spent enough time wading into it to have an opinion of my own. I just know that it exists and people have feelings about it. Yeah. Um, that's, as, that's as much as I've mm-hmm. gathered at this point. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So how does the process of character creation then set a player's expectations for playing the game? You know, we covered this a little bit. I know I was a little disappointed that we didn't get to roll a bathtub full of dice for our characters. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think with this, you were going to say you know immediately how just how intense the gameplay is about to be based on how intense it was to create mm. the character. I don't know if I finished your sentence correctly, but... Yeah, you, got, you nailed it. Uh, I would also say, what, and we've talked, we talked about this pretty extensively in the last episode, but... Um, it sets you up to know how, not just how to mechanically play your character, but how to play it in a role-playing context as well. Because those, like, positive and negative qualities give you a ton of information. And it's like, yeah, I mean, like, sometimes I don't even have a great idea. And then it's like, oh, my uh, my character has this negative quality, so I'm just going to be, like, I, like, I'm, you know, like, disrespectful to authority. So, like, I know anytime I'm in a situation, I'm going to play that because that's, like, my character's truth. Mm-hmm. And that kind of gives you, like, a little like nugget of information to hold on to if you're like kind of unsure of how to interact with the new environment. Yeah. I, re- I really like how the amount of options that you have for creating a character in this game really c- also sets you up for an unlimited amount of possibilities that this game offers while you're playing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's also like you have a skill that says, you know, pilot watercraft, mm-hmm. right? And uh, your GM drops you in the middle of a city on the lake and you're like, yeah, I'm going to go find a boat because my guy knows how to drive a boat. So I'm going to like push this so that I get like a, like I get to use some of the skills available to my character. And we don't really interact with too much of the Shadowrun lore, like the official lore, but like the lore that's like kind of hinted at in some of the options, like the character options. Um, also just kind of to your point, there's just like endless possibilities for places that you can go and like, depending on what level of shadow runner you're making, like if you're making like a prime runner, you're being like flown around the globe or going to space or like anywhere that we could go in the future while also there being like magic stuff. Uh, I feel like th- to me, that would be motivating if I was trying to get through making a character, I would just see all those options and be like, wow, like, what the heck is about to happen? Like, what are my friends going to make? What does the GM have in store? Like, uh, there's apparently, like, vampires and uh, weird neurotoxins and, like, moon bases. Like, I don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, the one thing I remember is that, like, vampires, like, one of their weaknesses is alcohol for some reason in Shadowrun. I don't remember why I remember that. It's but distilled I water. Was, I remember thinking that was weird. It seemed weird to me. <laughs> We had to fight a vampire. I don't remember why. Oh, that's cool. That's, that sounds cool. Yeah, we've not dealt with any vampires, really. Well, Zenith is a vampire. We just haven't revealed that. It's always yet. been oh, nighttime. Oh, surprise. <laughs> 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 yep, surprise. It's yeah, this not. is a special special leak of the background character info. On... He's actually been drinking blood, but um, we just haven't talked about it at all. Yeah, yeah exactly. Let's put this behind a paywall. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we've kind of covered this, or maybe... There just are a lot of them. But what do you think is one of the biggest flaws of character creation in this system? (laughs) Yeah, I would say it's just like, uh, it's like what I was saying earlier, like that, that's sort of like the, the bookkeeping, like spreadsheet feel to the back half of character creation. I do really think it does a great job, like pulling you into it and having like such a wide open, like prairie of opportunities to like create a character around. But yeah, you just you get slogged down on all those, you know, numbers and taking yeah. stuff away. And it's like at some point, if if your game is ever forcing people to like spend ability points on stuff they don't care about, I feel like that is bad. You know, mm-hmm. I think like yeah. forcing people to make narrative or mechanical choices about how their character interacts with their environment is like that. That's just like the opposite of what a role playing game should do. You should only be giving people choice to the extent that they want it. I think some of the knowledge. I, I agree with that. Uh, I think. 
just to zoom in on one thing in particular, the knowledge skills. So you have like your active skills, which are like your running, jumping, hacking stuff. But then you also have knowledge skills. And I feel like that might just be too open ended Mm -hmm. where it's like, I only have so many skill points. So I'm going to put five, I'm going to put seven skill points in Bible studies and five in boxing history. And that's all I have for knowledge skills. (laughs) And like, am I? You don't know believe, anything about anything else. Am I, yeah, am I supposed to believe that this Jesus character only knows about boxing and Bibles? It's like I know two things: boxing and Bibles. And I don't know how to dress myself or take a shower, but I feel like there should be, and certainly, like your your GM is going to be like forgiving. Uh, to that yeah, but it's thing. interesting when everything else is so like down in the nitty gritty that the knowledge skills aren't that way. Like when you have to know the difference between like these various kinds of watercraft or, you know, it's like I can only pilot large things or small things or like specific, you know, everything else is so specific. It's weird that the knowledge ones don't give you room to do that. Oh, yeah. And the knowledge skills don't have a list of skills you're picking from either. No, you you literally, make it up. You're like typing in your own your own like made up versions of it and they don't tell you how they're used so of course like i mean then you know uh even in ganon's game that we're running like because the knowledge skills have so little like anchor to how the game is played we rarely use anybody's knowledge skills right it's, it's like true. so rare that it comes up and when it does it is usually like in a way that is completely ham-fisted mm-hmm. right you know? and it's like oh you know yeah i'm gonna put you guys in this situation but you know about that right and it's like yeah. Well, sometimes it, it comes up by accident, but for the most part, it's like you chose just arbitrarily. And so the chances of it ever coming into play are so low, mm-hmm. so yeah. low, unless your GM is really crafting their story around what you know. But then that wouldn't really be true to life, really. Right. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It's just it's an interesting area because they don't give you a whole lot of guidance. And it's like you have 12 points to spend on this area where like you don't you couldn't even. Like I, yeah, I, I think that's a great one to zero in on because it, it is a hundred percent what I'm talking about when it comes to like just making random choices mm-hmm. yeah. in the midst of like a character creation process. I, I think pick, no, go ahead. I picked some really broad ones as Dak Rambo just because like I was trying to like cover as much ground as I could just to like make my character more useful. So like I'm. I have knowledge points in crime. And it's like oh, a that's... shadow runner. That's like everything you do. <laughs> I chose like Elvin wine. Yeah. Things that are like, when will we ever talk about Elvin uh-huh. wine? Uh, probably maybe one time. That's up to you. A again. little. Yeah. 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 You know what? But I'm when you do, sure. you'll be ready. Yep. Yeah. No. I'll be ready. But the thing is that I actually still won't be ready because I'll be like, oh, yes, Elvin wine. Huh? You mean from the. Metrol grapes, oh, <laughs> which I just invented. <laughs> um, One time, Gannon made fun of me because he was like, "Yeah, Blair has a uh, Matrix Crimes bank or, or Matrix Crime banks on his knowledge skill sheet. Like that's ever going to happen?" And I was like, "I just wrote that because I assume Zenith has robbed a bank before." <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of the worst things, though, because that's what we're talking about, right? Like the worst the flaws. It, the um, to me. Uh, when you increase, for example, if you spend later on karma on increasing like a base stat or whatever, how it affects a bunch of other things that you've added on to your character and different things that you would roll, then you would have to theoretically look back in the book to see every single other stat that you have and how the dice rolls are going to change now because you changed one thing now you know, six other things are going to change. And that to me, um, the fact that we use software has eliminated that basically. And it just tells you and calculates Mm -hmm. it, but doing it on paper and having to do that yourself, I imagine would be to me a nightmare. I am like absolutely not a math person and not a number Mm -hmm. person. So like even the fact that we're saying the word numbers, I'm getting a little PTSD (laughs) about it. Did we already (laughs) say things that we liked about the character creation? (laughs) We did. Yeah. That's not one of the questions here. (laughs) I I mean, I think that that's that was the frustration that I had when I was building characters for this, too, is just that like so many pieces 
tie together with so many other things that every time you were like, well, maybe I want to adjust this up or down, you'd basically have to start the whole process over mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. And that is so frustrating because then you you get partway through. I think we've all built characters where you get partway through and you have like a different idea of how you want to do something. And it's like, well, either now I can't change it, just forget it, or I'm going to completely start over. And that was so frustrating to me because there were a couple times where it was like, I, I just want to do this one thing a little bit differently. Nope, I can't. It's too late. I got to just like push on through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even in the very beginning when you're choosing your priorities, the A, B, C, D, E, you know, if you finally get to the page where you're buying gear or whatever and you're like, oh my God, I can never afford this because I chose the one that only gives me a thousand new yen. Mm-hmm. Ugh. And then you have to just redo everything so that you can change all your priorities and like readjust and i did that like four, oh, yeah. four or five times in my you know with certain characters where you're like this and, character would be so much cooler if they had this thing and again if you didn't have hero lab like you would never you'd never do that no you know i'd it be would, like it well, takes so long to get back to that point where you're like all right well let me respend all of the skills and uh, stuff that yeah. i already picked out one uh, <laughs> slightly other like we haven't really mentioned it too much um and i i do think it has its merits but i think that the way that the character creation and makes you pick your contacts um, is also uh, a little restrictive to me because you only have so many points that you can spend on like contacts and I'm like in real life because I'm really good at shooting and gymnastics that like shouldn't mean I don't know that many people Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I spent points on that. It's because you spent a lot of time training on shooting and gymnastics. You didn't have time to meet people. You need socializing. I could have theoretically met a lot of people. But you could also meet people that like gymnastics and shooting, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It it is weird that you have to, like, pick. It's like, here are your friends. (laughs) You have two friends. You have four (laughs) points to spend on contacts. So you can either have four friends that don't like you very much, or you can have one friend that really likes you. (laughs) I I know that that's that's just like like real life. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you know how we're all restricted to only having four friends. That's <laughs> true. That's true. I have, uh, you know, it's the MySpace top eight thing, but it's just like real, <laughs> real life. I, I, think I love that idea that someone's like, yeah, I guess I didn't make his contact on his Shadowrun character sheet. <laughs> and I have one, I have one friend and they're super well connected, but they're very disloyal to me. Oh, uh, they could get me like a dragon's skull, but, uh, that's, but- that's very funny to me because it's like none of the Neo Scum crew are on each other's contact sheets, even though they would 100% be the most reliable people to them, right? But we hadn't, well, in the beginning of the series, we hadn't all met. That's true. So. But even then, we weren't like, you know. Uh, but even now, would we add each other <laughs> to the contact well, sheet? I think player characters are, I, I feel in like. a separate category. Yeah. yeah. But the, the contact things I think are cool for GMs to be like, let me just see who these characters think Mm -hmm. they know so that now I can be like, okay, this one character knows a, like a ganger. So they theoretically hang out at a bar with this one gang. Maybe there's a rival gang that comes in. Like there's lots of inspiration there. Uh, but like in Neo scum, we're on a road trip across the country. So the scope of our game doesn't really lend itself to having like three friends around a hub Mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. Does it bother you to have to like establish those before you start playing? Because I, I feel like I didn't like that. Yeah, I and don't. I, I think that I like the idea. So uh, Knights Black Agents, for example, you have a pool of points to spend on contacts. And so you can say, I'm going to, at some point in the game, put two points into this contact. And then as you're playing, establish that person and how you know them and what you need them for. Whereas with Shadowrun, you have to do all of that up front. And I don't like that because I feel like it's harder to weave those things into the game and it puts much more pressure on the GM to do that. Mm. Yeah, totally. So, and, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that, like, Dak Rambo specifically has a lot of contacts, right? Like, I'm just Dak, making them up. Right. Dak Rambo knows a lot of people in the in our game. But mm-hmm. you didn't, you don't have every single one of those people that's ever been listed that you've known on the thing on your no, character if, sheet. if I did that, it would not have let me make the character. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, you know, I would say that uh, that's another one of those things where we sort of bypassed that that rule a little bit. Well, Dak, mm-hmm. Dak did anyway. Dak did. None, well, of, none but, of us have had a chance to be like, hey, I know this guy from uh, somewhere that's true. else. <laughs> that's you can. true. All you have to do is just know yeah, it. No, I mean, you've no, definitely I've shown never, us that we can do it. I know no one. I know no <laughs> one. Um, but <laughs> my contacts have never like 
the actual contacts that I've put on my character sheet have never really come up. Wow. How interesting. That means you can still change them. <laughs> right. Exactly. I'm pretty so sure that's what that means. I can still just change them. But then other characters that my character has known have come up. So like, you know, really, maybe we're just not using this in the way that it's supposed to be used or something. But it's so, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, what you were saying about like it putting a lot of pressure on the GM, like that's exactly the problem. It's like, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to make a character and he knows like a bartender uh, who is like a technomancer. He knows, uh, you know, this sniper who works for this gang or whatever. And then like already you're just throwing all of these like random dots for your GM to try to like string together mm-hmm. and work into a cohesive thing when your GM is probably just like trying to come up with a central narrative on their own mm-hmm. to begin with. I think it know? would probably, I, I don't know if I really haven't GM that much, but to me, I would like to know who your character knows just so that I could make something that's satisfying to that character or to that player. I think it serves a good, a good purpose in terms of filling out the backstory, but for the mechanical use of contacts and like, and we've never even done this, you know, like there's supposed to be a way you check in with your contacts that you like get information from them or like reference them on, you know, a run you're doing. And it's just like, it's so hard to like work that naturally into the like mechanic play of mm-hmm. the game. Yeah. I mean, I do think it like forcing you to come up with other people is a great move because even in D and D it's like, yeah, if you just had to name three people f- that you knew before you started, whatever adventure yeah. this was, that would be like a great like role playing exercise, mm-hmm. you know? Absolutely. I think it, I mean, it certainly gives the GM strings to pull, which I think is something that's really important. And I, I think gives the GM a lot of information about what kind of things are important to you as a player and to your character. I just think the way that Shadowrun does it is like, it asks for so much information ahead of time that you would normally kind of work out through play, I think. Mm-hmm. There's also a lot of stuff that I think is just like filler on this character sheet. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at mine, and this is from Hero Lab, so you can like know it's all official. Uh, but it's telling me my acid protection, my cold protection, my falling protection, my electricity protection, my fire protection, my fatigue resistance. And, well, like, some of that is pretty useful, though. Yeah, but they're all they're all the same. Well, maybe the way you built it just magically had them all the same. I think <laughs> we had like armor that protected against a specific yeah. thing. I mean, I think the reason this is so complicated is because Hero Lab just gives you every stat that it possibly knows. Okay, well, I, I think this is also just the shadow run. See, like mine. Yeah, I mean, those are, are definitely all armor, acid, cold, falling, electricity, and fire are all zero. But fatigue, I have eight resistance. Wow. So I don't know what we did when we were creating this character, but <laughs> you're not wearing we made armor. It That's really what it feels like. <laughs> weak, but very energetic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Those are like all the stats for your vault suit and fallout. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, how balanced then are the different types of characters that you can make in this game? Uh, are some significantly better than others? I've heard that characters who can like summon creatures might be broken. Mm. Uh, I feel like magic in general seems like super powerful in in Shadowrun. Yeah, and also like if you're going to summon a bunch of creatures into a battle, then suddenly you've just extended the session by like five uh-huh. hours. Oh yeah, absolutely. You, like, have <laughs> yeah. to go do all of the role because I I'm playing a character right now who has six pigeons who each have like specialties. <laughs> and each have their own initiative score. So every single combat. Oh <laughs> yeah, and they all do stuff and like one of them has one of them is like a technomancer pigeon. Uh and they're like so it's just like now I'm also playing with my own group of players <laughs> all live inside my head. Yeah, it does. You're just GMing your own pigeon game yeah, over exactly. the corner while everybody else is doing their own thing. It totally yeah. skews it in a way that's like, oh, you have all of these other advantages that like all the other characters do not have because you are playing seven characters. Yeah. You know, even if some of them can only do very basic things, well, Sometimes all you need to do is one basic thing and, you know, that's that's mm-hmm. enough. Yeah, I, I will say I think a lot of that is mitigated by, like, the GM's preference. So for the most part, it's like, I, I think even the multiple character thing is like, does the GM, is the GM going to let you fight with that character in every single thing that you do? Or is like, or are they enforcing whatever the rule is on, like, how often you can do that? And also, or, I'm not trying to, you know, like, cheat by right, doing yeah. this. No, no. So, But that's the thing is, like, I think, like, 
the the GM and the players are sort of like the balancing of those things. And I think because Shadowrun's so complicated, there's not really like a really easy way to like game the system because even if there was, there's probably a decent way for the GM to just mm-hmm. shut it down or at least like lessen the power of yeah, it. Yeah, totally. Um and I, I just think there's so many release valves that, like, I'm sure someone online is like, here's the most broken, uh, you know, like, character model you could ever create in Shadowrun. But it's like, yeah, sure, but, like, you know, what if what if a GM throws something at you where you, like, can't even move right out the gates? It's like, that's a whole different type of situation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. And at that point, if you spent that much time researching it, I feel like you just deserve that then. Like, <laughs> you've you've given away years of your life looking all of those mm-hmm. stats up. And so, like, I, I mean, as a GM, it would be my job then to just let you have at it. You deserve it at yeah. that point. Yeah, good job. I would even say if you're that person who, like, brought this, like, super min-maxed character to the table, the GM can just throw the entire rule book at you because there is <laughs> so much rule book to go around. <laughs> I, I was thinking, like, the most broken character I can imagine in Shadowrun would be a super powerful AI. Like, uh, I don't know if you've ever read, like, Neuromancer, but, like, the gods of this realm are just, like, AI that are so beyond, like, what a human can do. But then, even then, if I try to play that character, I'd be limited by my own intelligence. <laughs> it's, like, so much below that, and I would not understand, like, the zeros and ones behind what I was doing. So, like... Even if I made a super broken character, I would not be that character and could not faithfully role play it. I'd be like, yeah, he, uh, the computer, uh, bleeps and bloops. And, uh, does that work, Ganon? <laughs> did I do it? Did I, did I break the, the matrix? I thought you were going to say you, the most powerful character would be an AI that had like a hundred robots that it was controlling. Well, that, that it character could summon could robots. Yeah, absolutely, robots. Yeah. It could just turn any machine against whoever happens to be Amazing. in the area. Amazing. That's beautiful, and you should do it. Yeah. <laughs> you should build that character. How does building NPCs in a game differ from building PCs? Do you have to make NPCs the same way that you do no. regular characters? Well, please, have- God, no. <laughs> uh, well, if you use Hero Lab, I think there's a bunch of like presets, which I think I, I, Ganon's not here, cause he, and he makes all of our NPCs essentially. Yes. But I think there's like a pretty easy way to make it through software. I think like, and I think the book itself probably has a good bit of like presets for that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but also half the characters Ganon ends up playing that are like long time uh, characters who show up in our podcast are like random people. He walked up to us and was like, Hey, just so you know, the bar's over there. And, and we're, we're like, like, Oh, you're coming with us now. Yeah, and we're then like, <laughs> you're our best friend. Yeah. <laughs> And then Ganon ends up probably having to go home that night and like make a bunch yeah. of stats for that character. I, I, there's been a couple times where I think Ganon has found out for NPCs that we've sort of like kidnapped, literally or just <laughs> metaphorically. And he's like, "Yep, now they have to go because I'm tired of being this guy." <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I th- I would imagine that you don't need to build nearly as many stats for them because you can kind of as a GM probably pick which things that they're actually going to need to do. Yeah. You can probably say like, okay, they're only going to need these three skills. And Occasionally you know. within the software, Ganon has created some NPCs and then sent us, like if we were going to be playing them, he'll send us the files so that we can look at what their stats are and stuff and still we make the decisions as the NPCs. Yeah, um, We also play NPCs, which is pretty out there in terms of the role-playing game scene that's, i feel like yeah that's true but, um, <laughs> it's, kind of, it's so much fun to do that oh, yeah. so much oh, yeah. fun to like we love it yeah mess with stuff like that yeah um <laughs> but so i mean even on that thing you can see that it's like less than half as much uh detail on the that yeah and it's sheet. like most of that isn't even I mean, most of those are just combat skills, right? Right. Like, nine times out of ten, Ganon's not going to be like, yeah, just so you know, this is this random NPC's lockpick, you know, lockpicks skill mm-hmm. or whatever. Right. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. So, let's discuss our group's cohesion. Uh, how does the characters that we made <sighs> gel together? Uh, you <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, in a typical <laughs> session <laughs> of Shadowrun, um, I know there's not really a typical session since you could explore so many different topics in this world. Um, but, like, in general, how do you think we would fare in this world together? So I th- I'm thinking we're, like, lovable misfits. I'd imagine because of our two characters, or at least because of the uh, teacup, 
I think we're more pink mohawk than black trench coat shadow uh-huh. run. Yeah. Um, even though you I made think, Jesus. Yes, well, we are. I, I do <laughs> think that Jesus. I, I think they that, made a powerful Jesus. Though. I think, like, I think your Jesus character, could play in a black trench coat world. Oh for yeah, sure. your character. The Coco seems, Taxi is pink mohawk. Yes, Coco, <laughs> and the the gun and no, the fact no, no, that no. it is called Jesus or no, it's called well, Saint. We're called Saint. It's called Saint. Mm-hmm. Honestly, if if we had a uh, super Christian neck beard in our group, they would play this character. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that like I imagine what brings us together is probably. Mr. Johnson, you know, it's just like the most, yeah. like the the easiest quest hook of all is like, you, oh, we have a job together. We don't know each other. We're forced to work. We're all loose cannons. And I think that maybe the two of you got brought together by Mr. Johnson and you tripped over Teacup Piggy in an alleyway <laughs> because uh, Teacup Piggy is just a, a truly an awful character. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at it now and like this, this little piggy. Is, what can this piggy do? This piggy can just basically entertain. It's like a bard, but even probably worse than a bard. So a face. Not even a face. <laughs> I mean, uh, truly. What I'm thinking, too, is that I'm imagining that in our game, uh, Aura is like the um, uh, in Wizard of Oz. What's the name of the, the girl? Dorothy? Dorothy. So it, it's like one of these like coming of age stories and saint and the teacup pig are like uh uh jesus is the scarecrow or saint is the scarecrow the holy spirit with the gun is the tin man and then the teacup pig is the lion yeah and like aura i I imagine aura probably having some like deep backstory like emotional pull while we are figuring out (laughs) our stuff and probably protecting you and offering guidance uh in the way that those kind of like heroin games uh, and, roll out. Yeah, Tea I would. Cup Piggy is just happy to be included. Yeah, and is also cowardly. Yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, taking me along. I can see Tea Cup Piggy say- being kind of like the distraction. Like, oh, send yeah. in Tea Cup Piggy, Piggy first, and then everybody will be focused on them, and then we can do our <laughs> our stuff behind the scenes. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think with uh, with. Uh, saint and the holy spirit you have a pretty clear like straight absurd uh relationship there and then teacup piggy is like the comic relief and then aura is like the emotional heart i also wanted to add on one tiny detail which is if we're going for the full-on wizard of oz like you know mapping Mm -hmm. uh i'd say the coco taxi has like a little gold uh, like yellow brick road pattern up the center of it Uh, and maybe even says the yellow brick road somewhere that's cool i i think that you know you're miles morales then we've got uh, Por- P- Peter Porker. Oh yeah, and yes. we are uh, the <laughs> the. It's like old Spider Man, Nick is, Cage one, but the, the oh, yeah. noir Spider Man. Oh yeah, noir. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, noir Spider Man, but Jesus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, noir Spider Man, but Jesus. That's you know that common storytelling trope. Yeah. Of course, exactly. Uh, um, I mean, I think. Do we have anybody that can do any kind of like healing or anything? Uh, you're talking to Jesus? Of course. Yeah, actually, Jesus can heal for sure. That's awesome. Okay, we have just making three. sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, let's look at these spells. Analyze truth, astral message, broadcast, clear audience, clairvoyance. Man, none of these are <laughs> really we, we do have a pain relief. Where? It's one of our adept powers. Oh, I forgot we're an adept magician. That's great. <laughs> And we're a bartender, so we can heal with listening and no, serving drinks. No, I think drinks. we know a bunch of bartenders. Oh, you're right, you're right. Yeah. We can't do that. The only contacts that Saint has is a bunch of bartenders. Wow. Yeah. Wow, so here's something kind of cool that I just realized about Teacup Piggy. Upon death, uh, because of their metatype, they will vanish. What? So if Teacup Piggy got killed, they just disappear. Wow. And just, we, can't, we can't loot your body? Nope, nope. <laughs> Uh, here's a so, fun fact about the Holy Spirit. He is immune to normal weapons. What? Cannot be hit by normal weapons. Only by silver bullets, probably. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and he's got that AK-97. That's remarkable. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we do have a little bit of healing. <laughs> I got nothing, but I do know a lot about dances, poems, smells, songs, and the War of 1812. Dances, <laughs> poems, smells, and songs? Those are my knowledge skills. That's great. <laughs> and... I've got a good performance 
survival and instruction. I feel like that sounds like that sounds like the title of like somebody's autobiography. Dances, smells, songs, and poems. I was thinking <laughs> it, it sounds like it sounds like lyrics of like a the next verse of the DK rap from Donkey Kong. <laughs> Dances, smells, songs, songs and, and poems. And don't worry, Tika Piggy is always singing that song. <laughs> yeah, just to keep everyone uh, entertained. Oh, that is such a great. The Teep Cup picture write a book called Dances, Smells, Songs, and Poems. Yes. <laughs> so good. I also know about pistols, but I'm not strong enough to lift one. Well, so We'll work on that. Once you get some karma... We'll get you, you can... a microfiber pistol. <laughs> <laughs> can you even hold that? <laughs> I mean, probably It's as big not. as you, you know, but well, don't thing... worry. We've got some recoil suppression on this thing. It'll be fine. Oh, yeah. And we'll hook it up to a smart gun so you don't have to actually pull the trigger to fire. Whoa, that's cool. Just like yeah. mount it to their shoulder. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Cool. <laughs> I'd play that video game. I'd play the heck out of that. Yes. So let's talk about the system as a whole. What do you think about how it plays and how it lends to character growth as you play a story over time? So like, how does your character change as a person in the game? Oh, um, I think that... As you grow, because there are so many nuanced skills and things, uh, and you keep unlocking even more options, you know, for example, if you get an exotic weapon, you need a special skill to buy that exotic weapon and then add skills on top of that. Um, so, like my character, when she bought a whip, first I had to build up enough stuff to be able to buy an exotic weapon. Um, blah, blah, blah. But... You end up acquiring different skills that then you you use in your story that somehow like, how did this happen? Um, it gives you the inspiration to say like, what in the story made this moment happen for you? Was it something bad happened and, you know, you unlocked a new feeling or, or I, what? I know that um, the one of the ways Shadowrun, I guess, is encouraged to be played like by the book is that time passes and like when you're making your character, you have to select mm -hmm. a lifestyle and that's like every month you're paying your lifestyle cost. And like there's you could theoretically be like, I spent this month upping my hacking skills. So I'm spending my karma on these attributes. We don't play it that way because like our whole podcast has been like 10 days or something. Yeah. So we would never have had to pay rent. Yeah. And like we're all mm -hmm. just like. Homeless living in a van. <laughs> right. Stin yeah. Stinky as heck. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I know that there's the a mechanic river. where if you want to buy traits, uh, it's more expensive once you are out of character creation. It costs mm -hmm. twice as much. Um, so in a way, it feels like the game kind of discourages character growth or makes it make you just have to be that much more cautious about what you're putting your points into because you don't get that many depending on maybe you have a I feel like it, it's harder to grow yeah once you're playing the game yeah yeah I think like the progression system I'm not a huge fan of um mainly because it is like so specific and it and it feels like you often don't know why or like what you're trying to spend stuff on like D&D &D has a pretty easy mechanic where it's like oh you're gonna level up and then when you level up you have to make like a specific choice about what that means mm -hmm. and because you're in that particular character archetype you it's just kind of driving you further and further into like specializing but oftentimes with Shadowrun you've already maxed out whatever your like core set of abilities are so like you know when you first start out you're gonna be like oh I want to be a decker I'm gonna do six logic and then I'm gonna do six computer skill but it's like after that if you want to get better at hacking you don't really have like much wiggle room anymore like you can only get like wider at different things or you can try to spend a ton of karma to like pick up a new trait or something. Right. I, I think that's also a sign of the world that we're playing in. Like we're living in this capitalist dystopia. Of course, it's hard to improve yourself when you're like living in this dystopian system that, you know, if you're a shadow runner, you're living outside the system. It's an uphill battle. You know, you're not in a shonen jump thing where like, after 10 episodes, you can now unlock <laughs> your hidden power and you're like going Super Saiyan, which I would love to play that system. Yeah. <laughs> I would also say that like with karma, I find myself accumulating and accumulating and not spending it because of the fact that even making one 
new addition to my character is like you want to look through everything almost like you want to make sure you choose carefully because the next time you get to do that might not be for a while until you've you know accrued however many more points hawks has so much karma i'm blown away i'm like oh my god i'd spend that yesterday i i I do i have a lot of karma but the thing is that i do like to like incorporate it into how i'm playing in and continuously use these things you know what i mean and the more things i add the more i'm like i don't even know what i can do anymore (laughs) (laughs) well and you'd have to like change all those other things you'd have to go back and (laughs) make all those other adjustments too every time you move something around Mm -hmm. well that kind of ties into our final segment uh so why don't we go right into our character advancement discussion and take it up a level in this segment we cover how character advancement or leveling up works so let's start with how a character levels up in shadow run and what sort of perks do you get when you do that So the basic idea behind Shadowrun is you are uh, sort of similar to experience points. You are gathering karma. um, And when you first create a character, you get a certain amount of karma. And like Mike was saying uh, a second ago, the cost for everything is generally higher in advancement than it was during character creation. Um, And the basic idea is you're just Mm -hmm. accruing these points and you can spend them on skills. You can buy, you can also exchange them for money. Uh, Karma is like the universal currency of the of like character advancement in general. Um, and like Aladdin was saying, like sometimes you're trying to justify that with your GM because obviously, like you know, if you're playing a mission and you're in the middle of the desert and then all of a sudden you exchange your karma for like a new sniper rifle, it's like, okay, yeah. well, how did this happen? You know, like what what like what was this? Did you find this like buried in the ground? Because you don't want to just like materialize new skills and items out of nowhere. Yeah. But yeah. Level, That's, yeah. So leveling up doesn't happen in the very literal sense of you have leveled up now. You know, your characters aren't really at level one, level two, level three. They're sort of just, they are what they are. And then you can spend some points and, and increase certain stats, but not everything will change. Yeah. yeah. And stuff, some stuff has maximums as well. Right. And there's some ways mm-hmm. to get around maximums, but typically it's very expensive. And, like, if you are trying to do something that is pushing a character to a limit, that's all you're going to be doing for the foreseeable future as you just, like, hoard karma to spend on that. Like, right now, I have, like, very little karma in our current Neoscom game. And whenever I get enough karma to get, like, a new little thing, I'm almost always putting it towards, like, vehicle stuff just to, like, (laughs) make sure that we're all alive because we're in a vehicle for every mission almost. And it's like, I would love to give Dak the ability to do a roundhouse <laughs> kick, but I don't want us to die. So I'm trying to protect the, the crew. Do you find that frustrating that you, you can watch other people around you getting stuff, but you're sort of stuck like, you know, like hoarding it for a while when you. Ganon is very, a very generous GM. Uh, so stats don't always come into the equation. Sometimes I can say I'm going to do something and then Ganon's like, I don't know about that. And I'm going to be like, Trust me, I can do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, like, I'll have to spend an edge or something to, like, do some complex action that I'm like, I believe that I can do this. Even if my character is, like, out of shape or something. And he, he'll he usually say, like, that was a great character choice or, like, a very creative choice. You know, when you do something that uh, Ganon finds inspired, that's how you get karma. That's how you can do things that are bending the rules a little bit. Um, you know, if you can say that Dak Rambo's face is now on the front of the truck and he is Dak Truckbo and he is the truck now, like, yeah, that's an inspired character <laughs> choice. You are the truck. Yeah, at the end of the day, we are improvisers and we're going to have a good time no matter what the rule book says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is interesting because, like, advancement in our game is almost used as a way of just, like, coming up with new stuff to bring to the table mm-hmm. um, or, like, enhancing something that we're already doing a lot, which I feel like is pretty standard across any role-playing game but like i think shadowrun does feel a little limited in that because it doesn't feel like there's like a a new like i can unlock something like new that's sort of like out in a different direction than my character is right now but it doesn't always feel like i have a great way of like pushing forward further into my character beyond like diversifying what they're good at right well so there is one thing i want to say which is a little bit of a spoiler because i don't think i've ever used it um, so if you listen to Neo Scum, then here you go. Here's Ooh. a tidbit about Pox that I've never yet used. 
But I did buy something called Signature, which is uh, it requires you to once you kill someone to leave a signature behind. Um, so her thing is that she'll leave a lollipop behind or leave a piece of candy behind. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think I've actually killed anybody in quite some time since I bought this thing. Oh, okay. so but that signature buying that gave me more karma like to, because I added that because it basically leaves a trail like like I'm a dum dum and a, oh like a lollipop <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, so I leave behind like a little bit of a trail for people who are looking for evidence but that gave me more karma points that I can eventually spend on mm-hmm. something else to yeah. uh, increase my stats at some point because it's a negative trait exactly and you can still buy them it's just that you know they're they're not going to give you as much stuff in the future and uh, it didn't level up my character per se. In fact, it's sort of leveled down my character, but it's with the hope that eventually I'll be able to use it for something really beneficial and cool. That's really neat. I like that. I like when you have the potential yeah, to like thanks. mess stuff up. I, I don't know. I like making things hard on my characters. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do like the the concept of the karma system uh, and back to the, the video games that I, I jumped into this world in, um, karma was along the same lines as you spent it when you could, or you saved up for something big. And it always was one of those, uh, things that felt really good to get karma because you knew you were getting closer and closer to a goal. And it, it kind of feels like that it would probably be kind of the same way playing the tabletop game. Yeah, I think sometimes that's not always like doesn't always feel good though when you have to hang on to it for forever to try and get something. Cuz sometimes you you I don't want to like I don't know, especially if people around you are buying like little things here and there and you're just like waiting and waiting and waiting and it's like 10 sessions later and you're like now I can finally buy this one thing to like make myself a little bit better. That doesn't always feel super great. Yeah. The the bright side of that is that things are already so complicated that you often forget how much karma you have and you forget about doing those things. And like, I, I'm then like, Oh wow, look at, I got all these points and I totally forgot that I could even do this. Woo woohoo. Yeah. Um, yeah. I spent a ton of, uh, karma on a trait called lightning reflexes, which like boosts your initiative. And every time I'm not first in the initiative order, I'm like, that was a freaking waste. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll say I also took a uh, trait that isn't the lightning reflexes. It's like uh, I forget what the name of it is, but it uh, it what it does is so y- that your ability enhances your initiative role. Uh, and Z has one that literally just puts him at the top. Guts. Oh, it's is it n- guts? It's not guts because oh, I have guts too. Deck yeah. has guts, which he's also never used. Right, and Pox guts also. Guts is like a willpower thing. Yeah, it's sort of like, oh, who's gonna do this first? Your character is a brave one, and it's like, well, if we both have it, then really, who's gonna do it first? What guts does is that it just means that <sighs> we have advantages when people try to intimidate us, uh, okay. and. We, for the most part, are the ones doing the intimidating. <laughs> so, <laughs> trying to intimidate us. I'm not intimidated anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, it, it sounds like it would be a bit beneficial to have character advancement in mind during character creation, since it's uh, a little bit cheaper to get certain things during the creation process. Yeah, I, I would say anything that you don't see as like essential to your character, uh, you uh, you can probably leave for advancement because it'll take longer for you to get those skills. It's like you kind of want to build like a really good base and like make sure that you have like all the skills and abilities that you need to like get your kind of like day to day done. And then if you have something that you're like, oh, I think it'd be funny if this person or funny or cool or whatever, whatever you're playing this game for, um, mm-hmm. if you uh, if you like keep whatever that is in mind for your like advancement stuff and focus your like main skill points on what you're trying to do is like your character's like bread and butter. Oh yeah. There's like magic. Uh, you have to be like magically awakened to do a lot of magic traits. Obviously you have to be proficient with computers to do a lot of like the computer stuff. Like I thought it would be funny one time to be like, I'm going to give Dak the ability to like, who's a trucker uh, to, to make him really good at like word processing or, or some, some specific like 
decking skill just so he could help Z out in a specific, like, it would be funny if he had one random skill in this thing that he should know nothing about. But then the game was like, no, you can't do that. And I was like, okay, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in one day anyway. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Stay in your lane. And you can uh, you can sometimes unlock some other things to be able to get out of your lane, but it would probably take a very long time to get any any good at them. It, it kind of reminds me of if you've ever played Final Fantasy X, where you're oh, like, yeah. th- there's like a big grid system, but your character is starting somewhere in the grid. So if you want to make your magic character really good at fighting, you have to go much further Probably at the expense of your magic abilities. Or like in Skyrim, where you have like that, the constellation chart, and you're like, okay, well, you have, you can buy into this skill, but then there's all these little other things that come off this skill, and, you know, you really want to invest in probably all those things or a bunch of those things in that one thing, and then it leaves a bunch of other stuff sort of neglected. But it still makes you strong. It's just strong in a sort of specific way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking now what you could do is if you made a character who had a lot of points to spend on like the uh, skill groups, that's like one way to quickly become a jack of all trades because you could probably get a lot of different skill groups, which are like you're just spending one point, but you're getting three skills boosted to a certain thing. So you could probably make a character who's could do anything that a shadow run character could do at like a really average medium yeah that would actually be kind of a cool character that would be interesting just like the every person yeah shadow runner like yeah i i can do anything he's got just level <laughs> stats yeah. i can do anything okay yeah. <laughs> i'm yeah. just all right and i don't have that much essence for my magic but uh but i can do it but, but I, I can log online and do a spell <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I think that about wraps up our discussion on all of this. Is there any other uh, final thoughts that you guys want to add? Uh, Catalyst, if you want us to help you rewrite your game, hit us up. Yeah, let us know. We'll help <laughs> rewrite Shadowrun to something more user friendly. <laughs> we'll just we'll write the easy mode version of it. We'll just tell you like here every skill just takes one six sided die, and if you get a six, it succeeds. If you get a five, it succeeds. Hey, don't spoil a, it all, Blair. Yeah, okay. don't spoil don't all the rewrite. Uh, <laughs> don't work what, for free here. Yeah, yeah, numbers numbers one through four TBD. We're still working on it. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. maybe get some sensitivity readers too for your stuff. Yeah, for real. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Shadowrun character creation. Do you want to remind everybody where they can find you and what things you are working on? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, at Blair underscore Brit on Twitter. Uh, I'm part of Neoscom, as are my friends here. Um, yeah, check me out. I'm on Twitter uh, at It's Migdal Time. I stream with Eleni and friends. We stream under... It's Mike Lenny time on twitch.tv. Um, yeah. I am on Twitter or Instagram, whatever you want, at Electric Eleni, uh, Neoscum, and uh, it's Mike Lenny time on Twitch. Very cool. Well, thank you again for sitting down to do this with us. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. We'll be here next week. <laughs> we'll be here next week. <laughs> More Shadow Run. <laughs> well, surprise. <laughs> Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the ship notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. 
So go out there and create some amazing people. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Design Doc. Join hosts Hannah Schaefer and Evan Rowland as they redesign a role-playing game. Design Doc is an experiment in public participatory analog game design. It's fun, it's messy, and you're invited along for the ride. Yeah, that's 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 close enough, I guess. Yeah, I feel enough. like mine's gonna be super off because my stupid internet. Uh huh. Yeah, so uh-huh. Amelia is having Sorry, some Ryan. technical internet issues right now. She's about three seconds behind us. You know what? We're gonna work with that. Can you just uh, can you anticipate what we're gonna say, maybe, and just kind of really lean into whatever <laughs> feeling you're getting, and just like you know what? I'll just like laugh a bunch, and we'll just like cut it in. Now and that be fine. now that we like. That's good. Yeah, you, that's can, right. you can also just say stop. stop. <laughs> Please stop. Depending on how you're feeling, we'll just uh-huh. pause after everything we say. That would be a really nice gift for Casey, the editor, probably. <laughs> I mean, I can get rid of that blank space real easily, but <laughs> that's yeah. That dude, how does how, do, how does he do that? <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, one sec. We have a kid intrusion. Uh oh. We intrusion. have a kid intrusion. <gasps> kid intrusion. That's my shadow runner. Let's get some. Let's get some uh, <laughs> some suggestions for our characters from the from the child. Yeah. That we find that, that uh, the, the, the innocent mind of a child creates the most powerful Shadowrun character. I characters. was just saying earlier to my friend who said that he's going to be trained to become an elementary school teacher or primary school. He was like, yesterday a child came up to me and they said, did you know I have a wife? And he said, oh, really? What's her name? And he said, Laura. And he said, oh, well, how did you meet? And he said, in the playground. And then he said, and where did you get married? And then he's like, uh, actually, we're not married. And then just sort of trailed <laughs> off and like wandered away. Dude, that's like, kids are very good at comedy. That's like, some, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Next level, like, uh, that's like the lawyer, like catching him in the lie. Like, just <laughs> yeah. like setting up the scenario so that he can break him down. You know, I said he was roasted. <laughs> Wait a second. What was that kid's name? I don't know. I gave some kid like a three hundred dollar wedding uh, <laughs> gift. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh no! Was he in oh, London? Bummer. Yeah, he was in London at a playground. <laughs> 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 tell me how to oh, language. walk please, down the street. Please. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> tell, uh, tell me how to, to walk down the street. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I got impassioned talking about Shadowrun. <laughs> Oh, wait. You, you, oh, you cut you out. Cut out. Oh, no. You've n- never been more likely to murder someone than when oh, you're no. pregnant. And so you think that it's a positive yes. quality because it makes you stronger as a character. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Absolutely. Even though you cut yeah. out, I filled in the blanks. And, <laughs> yeah. Is, is Aura like our mom's old handle when she was like master hacker in the previous generation oh we Uh-oh. lost sound oh. we lost but sound. yes to answer your question yes, yes. can you hear us that sounds can you hear us? That, that would be pretty sweet Uh-oh. we can't hear you oh what happened hello oh, oh did that did we weird stuff happen it cut out right as you were saying something which just sounded initially so cool and then we couldn't hear anything <laughs> <laughs> is is aura's is aura the the name that we go by our mom's like hacker oh, name no. from previous oh, generation of hackers. What the heck? You cut out. You cut out and literally. literally, literally the exact, the same are you? Is this a out. bit? Are you just like? Are you just like? You're not talking. He's not talking. He's just mouthing. Hold on, hold on. Guys, guys, guys. I think it's, it would be cool if it's a Aura prank. was the name of the mom. <laughs> Yeah, we suddenly hear your baby crying in the background. <laughs> it's like that was you're like you're like mouthing words, and then <laughs> hey, we, okay, and your wife walks okay. in like, "What are you okay. doing?" One more try. All right, so Aura was our mom's hacker name. <laughs> okay. so we can hear you so far. When she was uh, a hacker in the previous generation of. Oh my God. <laughs> I didn't 
Do it again. <laughs> Maybe we save this for the, the discussion part. Yeah. I'm, you know? We'll figure it out when the episode this is. This is information you're, you're just not allowed to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll send you an email yeah. and be like, so okay. this is this is like a mi- this is meant to be a mystery yeah. to our characters. So you yeah. know, we don't know, and that's yeah. just <laughs> yeah, that's this the is, way it has to be. This is backstory that <laughs> our characters are not face. privy to. Oh yeah. my god, that is so funny. We can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's that's funny amazing. is that I guess on the master recording you will be able to hear both. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so the whole we'll time. just sound like we're laughing at Nothing. I don't know. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Okay. Well, you'll have to wait until the episode uh, airs to know what we are talking about. <laughs> and just, yep. Just get the end, just drip, drip with anticipation. <laughs>